Hey everyone, Ripley with Bob's Watches. I'm here with Justin for another episode of Watch Talk. Now, obviously you can spend a ton of money on luxury watches, but everyone has to start somewhere. So today we're talking about some of the best luxury watches for starting a collection. Also, if you haven't done so already, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel so that you can stay up to date on our latest video content. All right, so I guess before we get started, a uh, quick wrist check. Uh, what are you wearing today? I'm wearing the vintage Rolex Submariner, reference 5513. Nice, that's the uh, late, the final evolution of the dial with the, the gloss, gloss surface dial. and the yeah. pine markers. Yeah, yeah. lovely. I, yeah. Really underrated, but I think it's a it's a great one. Yeah, I love it. I go to it all the time. What do you got on today? Uh, also a vintage Rolex, uh, my 5500 Air King. Um, I figure with the starting a collection, this is one of the ones that I kicked Very it off. Very appropriate. With. Yeah. And uh, I still recommend it. If you're, we're discussing modern watches today, but sure. if you were wanted to go the vintage route or just wanted to get your feet wet with Rolex in general, I still think the 5500 is one of the best buys. Right. You know, under five grand all day long, no Definitely. matter the dial, and um, really clean. Today, it's all modern watches, yeah, but modern, if we were talking modern. about something older, that would definitely be on the table. Yeah, and it's quite a bit more affordable than the modern ones yeah. as well, but apples to apples, let's talk about the modern so watches. So let's get into these. What do we have first? <clears throat> to kick it off, we have a Rolex. Uh, this is the current production Oyster Perpetual 41, so mm -hmm. it's the, the largest size currently available. Um, it's not the absolute cheapest watch in Rolex's catalog, but it's the cheapest collection, so these at retail range between about 5,100 and 5,900. Okay. Uh, this would be on the higher end of that. Um, but time only, first came out in 2020, new generation 3230 movement. This is quintessential Rolex, and um, obviously it has a bunch of fun dial colors available, but mm -hmm. if you were starting a collection, you'd probably want something a bit more versatile, so maybe a black or silver, mm -hmm. in this case black, and it'll be cheaper if you're getting it pre-owned as well. Um, what do you think about these compared to the some of the older OPs? So I really like these, and specifically this one. I'm definitely not the one watch guy, right? I don't think I could ever yeah. be the one watch guy. But if my arm was twisted and you know I had to, to call out a watch to say that's gonna be my one watch every day forever, this would be a very big contender. Um, I feel like it just does a lot. It can kind of be sporty, it can be dressy. Um, I really love that black dial. It's got that kind of sunburst on it. You can see it a little bit here. Yeah, they call it bright black, and granted yeah. they have a lot of different blacks, but this one it is, it isn't like a matte black, it isn't a gloss black, it does kind of have that Right, Sunburst so usually exactly, you see yeah. a, like a, a very high bit, or a high polished gloss black or the matte black, um, and this one's kind of the sunburst. It's like uh, like the blue dial you see on the Submariner with the sunburst and out on the sun. I mean, in here it looks nice, but once you get it on the sun, it really looks good. Yeah, I mean, I think, well, up until the last couple of years, the Oyster Perpetual is really an underrated mm -hmm. um, collection as a whole. Um, it kind of is the two core features of Rolex, self-winding movement, water right. resistant oyster case, nothing else, no more or yeah. less. Um, and But only since this 2020 update with all the crazy colors have we seen it become a model that's hard to get. Granted, at retail, this watch is under six grand, and all the watches we're discussing today are around that four to six grand point sure. at retail, but um, you can't get this watch at around six grand. Uh, you'll be paying nearly twice that on the open it's market. It's trading well over retail yeah. on the secondary market, right? Yeah, now granted, you'll be paying more if you want green or yellow mm -hmm. or turquoise, but even for just the standard black or silver dials, it's thousands more than um, its sticker price. So right. it is something to consider, but if you wanted a Rolex and you wanted just one watch to go anywhere, do anything and look great doing it, this would be a solid Exactly. Contender. It's. I mean, it's... Uh, it's very simple, right? It's a time-only watch, which I personally like. I like time-only watches. I just there's something nice and and clean about you know the simplicity of the dial and not mm -hmm. having the cyclops and not having the date. So to me, that's a selling point. I really like that. Um, also, it's the only Rolex that we're showing today, right? So if you're looking to get into luxury watches and you know you really want that Rolex, you're really looking for that crown this is gonna be one of the most cost-effective ways to do it, right? Yeah, absolutely, and because it's a newer, uh, it's a current production, it's a very new reference, mm -hmm. um, you're not gonna have any issues going forward with parts availability, servicing that. Any of these watches are still under their factory warranty because mm -hmm. Rolex grants them five years uh, when they sell them new. So, yeah. you know, it's a kind of a carefree watch and it could really be your go anywhere, do anything watch. Um, now, our next one isn't necessarily the broad strokes watch. It was actually specifically designed for something, and that is the Omega Seamaster Diver uh, 300 meters. Um, unlike the Oyster Perpetual, which was more of to be your everyday watch, mm -hmm. worn with anything, certainly can take it in the water. It's 100 meters water resistant. This is 300 meters water resistant, purpose built dive watch, rotating bezel, helium escape valve. Um, it is a diver, but it's also a bit dressy, so you, you could dress it up a bit more, and um, I think it would be a solid one watch This collection. is one of those divers that 
probably can be dressed up more than any other one. Maybe it's the mm -hmm. whole James Bond thing that's just in my head. I don't know. But to me, I think that you know, if you have a dive watch and you're you know you're wearing it with a suit or a tuxedo for that matter. Um, this is the one that could pull it off, right? Yeah, now it could have been, we were brainwashed throughout all of the 90s watching Brosnan wear one with a suit, right. but they do, Omega does have other dive watches. If you wanted something more purpose built, you've got the Planet Ocean, you've got even the vintage inspired Seamaster Diver, you've got the Ploprov, which is its own thing. Mm -hmm. This is a more elegant diver. It's got the scalloped edge instead of a more aggressive coin edge. The bracelet itself, uh, love it or hate it, is dressy. Um, but with this one, you also get a lot of tech, which uh, mm -hmm. you don't often see at this price point. Again, at retail, right about five grand, but what you get, ceramic bezel, laser engraved ceramic dial, uh, in-house meta-certified coaxial movement, so, um, you know, it's anti-magnetic and it's, you know, more water resistant than you'll ever need. Um, I think the Speedmaster would also be a great candidate from Omega for mm -hmm. a way to start out a collection, but it does cost more mm -hmm. and it doesn't have the water resistance, and I would recommend the manually wound model. And so if you're really just starting out, this might be a bit just easier to kind of start collecting. Sure. If you wear it every day, you'll stay running. It has a date. You can jump in the pool, go mm -hmm. swimming in the ocean, go diving. You're sure. not going to need to worry about it. Yeah. And um, I think being able to see the movement for someone who doesn't have a wealth in, of watches and isn't used to seeing crazy decorated yeah. movements, just being able to see what the different parts are. Mm -hmm. And when someone's talking about a balance, we, we'll be able to look at your own watch and mm -hmm. go, oh, it's that thing. Yeah. I think there is some value to it, especially when you're starting out. And it can also serve as a benchmark going forward for other types of movement finishing. Yeah. And you know, it, that's a pretty solid benchmark. <laughs> Absolutely. And if you're looking for a diver, like say you know, you're really into something like a Submariner, right, which costs twice the price at retail, well over twice the price on the secondary market. I mean, this competes uh, specs-wise and technically on every level. It surpasses actually, it. Yeah, yeah, surpasses it. I mean, no one no one outside of a handful of individuals needs a helium escape valve, but you do have it. Right. You also have a ceramic dial. The ceramic dial, the ceramic bezel. Anti-magnetic, metacert. So it's, you know, not only going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Samariner, it's really, you know, barking at its heels sure. and is offering a bit more, but again, at one half, they're the price yeah. uh, open market. It's nice. I, I like this watch a lot. I think my favorite part is the dial. Um, I like it in the black that we have here. I also like the blue. That's really nice. I'm a sucker for blue. And with that wave dial, the to white me, it's is also a, great. As really the silver. Good too. So, yeah, I think that's yeah. also just like the OP, you do yeah. have your choice of colors. You also have your choice of metal. So, if you want to flex a little bit and want a solid gold or two tone model, sure. also options. The two tones look really good on this. They, they we do. We were just looking at one, and I was surprised because I'm not a two tone fan. And uh, I surprised myself on how nice I thought that two tone looked. Yeah, and similarly, the cost of getting one of those versus a two tone sub, it's, you know, Again, it's, yeah. it's quite a bit more affordable. Yeah, it's um, a good choice. I guess moving on to another dive watch that also fits the brief, it, the Tudor Black Bay 58. So the 39 millimeter version of the fan favorite Black Bay, mm -hmm. this is kind of the one that I think most people are gravitating towards. Yeah. Uh, and it's a great size. It is. It's a nice size. It's got a good look to it. Um, you know, it's these Tudors and, and the Black Bays in particular, I feel like I've gotten a lot of traction over the past years, right? Like they've really kind of become a fan favorite and they got a big following. I think for good reason. It's a great designed watch. It wears really nice. And Yeah, we've seen the collection expand. This is the original one, mm -hmm. and the, but then they had the navy blue. Now right. they have it in sterling silver and gold mm -hmm. and also bronze. bronze so yeah. they've really expanded the collection and I think if that bodes well for those of us who prefer this case size to the full size mm -hmm. one. Um, similar to the Oyster Perpetual, it's a three-hand time-only watch, mm -hmm. so no date, no, no anything like that. Uh, it is chronometer certified, so uh, COSC, not Rolex's superlative ones, but you get 200 meters of water resistance and, of course, a rotating timing bezel, so just like you would expect from a dive watch, you know, whether or not you're diving, that feature does come in handy. Mm -hmm. um, again, I think if you're looking at vintage subs like that look and are scared by the tens of thousands, hundreds exactly. of thousands of dollars uh, it takes to obtain one, this is a great watch that is genuine to its history, mm -hmm. um, isn't a direct carbon copy of any you know vintage model, sure. um, and of course it's from the greater Rolex parent company, right. so quality-wise is, is really top-notch. So if you're like the... Omega, if you're you know really into the Submariner, really into the modern dive watches, that's a great one. For me, if you're really into kind of the vintage styling and you know the just the vintage watches in general, but you're not ready to spend 20, 30, 50, 100, whatever thousand dollars for some of these pieces, this is a great modern watch that has that feel, it has that look. Um, just little details like the um, 
the pip surrounded with the red triangle. It has the the little bit of the dome crystal. Um, you know the patinaed colored of the markers. Yeah, all these are even, kind of like even the the faux rivet style links. Right. Yeah. All these features are you know inspired from the original vintage pieces, just kind of you know done in a modern way. I think it's really nice. It, it it really has that you know vintage styling on your wrist in a modern piece, which I think is really yeah. Cool. I think dive watches as a, as a whole are really popular, but not everyone wants a modern dive watch because it, it as a whole a modern dive watch is almost a uh, you know an oxymoron as far as purposeful modern dive watches. Sure. A modern dive watch is a computer. Right. Um, and so a lot when a lot of people want to wear a dive watch, they're doing so because they like the history of the dive watch, what it once was. And so a lot of people, if the Seamaster isn't your cup of tea because it is unapologetically modern, right. I think having a vintage dive watch where if you like the format of the piece but don't necessarily like the modern take on it, I think having the option of either going modern or vintage within this category of timepieces, I mean, we've never had more options, and I think the Black Bay 58 might be one of the top vintage dive watches. Absolutely, on the yeah, and it saves you on, you know, vintage watches come with their own set of responsibilities, right? So there can be problem with parts, and mm -hmm. you know, you're uh, uh, oftentimes you're more careful. You're not positive about the the yeah, depth my, pressure ratings and the bracelets. Sometimes yeah, the hand, the loom in the hand might be half a century old. Right, yeah. exactly. This one gives you all that styling without any of those kind of responsibilities that come along with you know a very expensive watch that's maybe 50 years old. Yeah, and I also worth noting, um, it's a lot thinner than the standard Black Bay. It is. So it's 39 versus uh, 41, and quite a bit smaller than the Seamaster, which is 42. But I think more importantly is how thin it is. It's, look at it relative to the clasp, it's quite a bit thinner. And so yes, it's a few millimeters smaller, but in terms of the on the wrist presence compared to the GMT or the full size models, it's um, it's superbly wearable. It's quite noticeably yeah. thinner, yeah. And it wears really nicely. Another one at 39 millimeters, is our fourth watch here, uh, Grand Seiko Spring Drive. Um, this isn't a dive watch. You can tell there's no you know, bezel. Um, it's kind of a go anywhere, do anything watch. Yeah, but this is probably the dressiest watch we have in the collection. I was just about right? to say, I think yeah. this is the dressiest one that we, um, you know, we're, we're showing today. But it still has a screw down crown, screw down case back, water resistant to 100 meters. Um, you know, uh, I, but I think that the real piece of this watch is its movement. It's right. a spring drive. Yep. This watch marks the point of entry for the spring drive. So this particular reference is the SBGA 285. Um, it marks the point of entry into the spring drive movements as a whole. Right. Um, spring drive, for those that aren't familiar, is you know it's kind of the best of both worlds. It is a mechanical caliber, but at the regulatory organ, instead of having a traditional balance, it's got a quartz-powered oscillating crystal. Mm -hmm. So there's no batteries. It, charges itself almost with just the static friction, kind of like how braking on like a hybrid car works. But powering the watch is a traditional mainspring. Mm -hmm. um, the benefit though is one, you get an incredibly smooth glide on the second hand, but more importantly, accuracy is in line with what you'd expect with quartz. Mm -hmm. Less than a second a day, I, they rate it to less than 15 seconds a month. And you compare that to Rolex's superlative chronometer standards, which are incredibly, incredibly good, which permit you know, plus minus two seconds a day. Mm -hmm. This is, you know, about half a second, less right. than that. So it's, um, it, it, it's, you know, what you're getting performance-wise is unique. Only Grand Seiko does spring drive. Mm -hmm. And um, it might be the most under the radar model here. I think it's definitely the most under the radar model here. Um, I really like this one a lot. I think this is a great choice. Aside from being probably our least expensive watch out of the five, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's gonna be the most accurate. And the fit and finish is just, I mean, we know Grand Seiko's Zer fit and finish. polish, yeah, everything. It's just amazing. Beautiful. When you look at this thing up close, you look at the hands under a loop and you, you get it in the sunlight. Um, I'm Every single time, it's nothing new and I'm always blown away by how perfect it is and how fantastic every angle and every little bit of polishing and brushing you know, looks on this, this entire watch. So um, I think it's a great choice. And, and this is one similar to the Rolex that I think can do a lot of things. It can definitely look dressy. It can go kind of sporty. It can definitely mm -hmm. go casual. Um, I love the spring drive. I think even if you're into luxury watches and you know, you're looking to get into a spring drive, this is a fantastic one because spring drive is something special. And, you know, for anyone out there who's not really familiar or doesn't have one, um, I would absolutely make that recommendation. Yeah, I, I often say if you're going to only own one Grand Seiko, really consider a yeah. spring drive because it is only, you can only get it from them and, you know, they'll put it into a couple uh, yeah. Seiko models as well. Um, worth noting, this one has a power reserve indicator. Uh, I know a lot, it's kind of a controversial point on a lot of spring drive models, but 
it is there. Um, I like I, it. I like I like it personally, um, but I know some don't like it because it throws off the symmetry. Mm -hmm. Also has a date display, sapphire crystal. Mm -hmm. It is a good candidate for your go anywhere, do anything watch, yeah. and especially if what you're where you're going is mostly in office and you're you know wearing a button up or a coat yeah. or something like that. It's a little more. Um, appropriate than say like a purpose-built diver. Not sure. to say you couldn't wear that with a suit, but it is, you know, this is the thin it watch. It's nice, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, you know, kind of even dressier hand shape. And that's second hand, right? I mean, I don't know if it's just me, but that, that sweeping, constant movement of the seconds hand is like so, uh, it's just so beautiful. And I know all the other watches like Rolex, you know, it has the sweeping seconds hand as well, but um, just the way this one, it's just, it's like almost relaxing and calming yeah, well, with how the Rolex, smooth it is. It's gonna still be ticking, sure. just granted multiple times a second. With this one, it's, if you look at the balance wheel, there's no back and forth oscillation. It mm -hmm. just glides in a single direction at a controlled rate. And so that's what the hand is doing. It's not your imagination. It is literally just slowly gliding mm -hmm. around the dial. Um, and it doesn't, and it's completely silent as it yeah. does that too, which is really nice. Okay, so you wanna go into our last watch? Yeah, uh, the opposite of what you know we were kind of just looking at. This is our largest watch. It's also our most feature-rich watch, uh, and it is a Breitling Avenger. This is nice, this is our only chronograph. It right? is, yeah. It's a, uh, this one has a 45 millimeter case diameter. 300 meters water resistant, so it's literally as water resistant as, uh, you know, like a Submariner or a mm -hmm. Seamaster. Um, but it's an Avenger, so it's not like the Super Ocean, which is a dive watch. This could certainly be used for diving, and as you see here, it's got a rotating bezel mm -hmm. complete with a luminous pip at 12. So the Avenger, it's, Breitling describes it as kind of their you know, exercise in superlatives and just, you know, sure. it's tons of features. Super tough, super reliable. Yeah. Um, not committed to the ski, uh, not committed to the sea or the skies. It's kind of like a pilot diver, yeah, military, does everything. everything. Yeah, it's not marketed as a dive watch. It's definitely dive capable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nor is it marketed as a pilot's watch. It kind right. of sits in this area of just these very overbuilt uh, Breitling watches. But this has a lot of those hallmark characteristics: slant link bracelet. Be bezel with rider tabs. Mm -hmm. um, the movement in this is the Breitling uh, B13, which is uh, based on a Valju 7750. So it's, uh, you know, workhorse engine, serviceability. It's got a screw down crown, pushers. Uh, pushers are not screw down, which, you know, grants you easy access to them, but mm -hmm. the watch itself still is water resistant to 300 meters. So that's. You yeah, know. I think those are some of the features that kind of, uh, we're talking about entry level, those are the features that make this a great choice. Um, maybe you don't have a watch box full of divers and pilots and all these other things, and you know, you're really looking to get that first watch, that, you know, one luxury watch, and you don't, you can't buy a Submariner and a Daytona and, you know, all these things. This kind of fits the bill for a lot of those boxes. Yeah, and it also lets you kind of see what features do you use. Do you, are you a chrono guy? Are you a mm -hmm. rotating bezel guy? Um, do you really find you need that much water resistance? Or you have more than enough here regardless, you won't need, find yourself needing more. Right. Um, you know, do you find yourself wearing it on the bracelet? You can easily switch it out for a strap. So I think it's a good one to sort of test the waters without spending a ton of money yeah. to get these same features. And also, if you know the minimalist vibe, uh, two of the three or two of the five watches we looked at are time only, like not even a date. Exactly. And the other two are just time and date. So if you wanted more features, and if that's sort of your cup of tea. Well, here you go. Or if you wanted something with more wrist presence, I mean, just that's it. Look yeah. at the thickness this of that is, one. It's a big watch. It, yeah. If you're looking for something that's, you know, going to get some attention, that's, um, you know, really going to yeah, be a presence on your wrist. Compare this it is here it. next yeah. to the Grand Seiko, and it is encroaching on almost twice the thickness. Right. It has three times the depth rating. Uh, but, and you know, a multitude of other features. Uh, but also worth mentioning is it does have a chronometer certified movement. So all the watches here, in addition to all being, at least at retail, between mm -hmm. around four or six grand in stainless steel, they all have either chronometer certified movements or ones that exceed it. So uh, the spring drive, it's better than any chronometer yeah, standards. Yeah. Um, and then all the others are, whether it's Metis, COSC, or Rolex's sure. own, are chronometer certified as well. And that makes this a great deal, right? I mean, this is, around $6,000? Yeah, at retail, and just like the Grand Seiko, you can often find a deal on these yeah. um, when you go pre-owned. This model's just out of production. Uh, it's um, kind of from the mid-2000s. Mm -hmm. 
you can get these all day long at under five, mm -hmm. off around about four grand pre-owned, yeah, which that's is, great. yeah, fantastic. For this deal. many features and a chronograph? A uh, mechanical chronograph yeah. from Breitling with over 300 meters of water resistance. It, it checks a lot of boxes. Yeah. And, you know, again, if it was your only watch, you'd be okay. You'd have it for a chrono, you got a date, you got a bet. Yeah, you're all good to go. I like that it has the, like you said, it's a capable dive watch. It has more water resistance than you'll ever use, um, but it's also a chrono and it's kind of a jack of all trades, but it, it definitely leans towards that pilot feeling, which is Breitling's, you know, that's that's, that's their style, house, that's yeah. their game. So um, I really love the, you know, the split color sub dials, um, just the the overall kind of uh, like airman feel over the whole thing I think is really yeah, nice. Yeah, and also worth noting that if someone doesn't like the large uh, Arabic numerals, mm -hmm. um, they make the Avenger with traditional index markers as well. So uh, d obviously different case sizes, plenty of different dials to sure. choose from, even a few different material option choices. So yeah. it is a pretty diverse collection. And um, for those that like the Breitling aesthetic, I think these represent a fantastic point of entry. Yeah, um, this is a pretty pretty clean. You know, it's it's got the black dial, um, and like you said, there's things all up to different materials for the cases and you know different colors. They get to some crazy colors. So yeah, there's quite a range, right? This is kind of a more uh, more subdued and more subtle version of it. But if you wanted something that's even more loud and even more of a wrist presence and in your face, dial. like it definitely yeah. hits it. Yeah, Breitling does a good job of hitting some of those really wild colors and, and eye-catching pieces. I know which one I would choose between these five, but I'm curious to hear which one you would. Uh, you know, as always, unlimited budget, gotta keep it. What would uh, what would you pick be? This one, there's there's honestly a few up here that are very close to getting the nod. But if I'm choosing just one, and I kind of mentioned this when we were reviewing it, I got to go with the Oyster Perpetual 41, just because I think it's beautiful, it's clean, and it does everything. It's you know it can be sporty, it can be dressy, you can put on a strap, it looks great. I just I think it's so versatile. Like I said before, I'm not a one watch guy, but. If I was forced to be, this one would be a very heavy contender. So that would get my nod. Um, how about you? I have a hard time not recommending the Rolex. Um, and if you're able to get one at retail, by all means, go for it. I have a little, my wrists are a bit too small. This is 34 millimeters today, okay. that's 41. I'm not able to, it's a bit too large for what I'm comfortable with. But the other thing to consider is if you're able to get it at retail, a lot of these things are in the same kind of price bracket. Sure. If you're not able to get it at retail, you're gonna be shelling out nearly twice as much or more for this watch uh, compared to some of these. Right. And so for that fact alone, um, I, well, I'm tempted by the Grand Seiko, mm -hmm. but again, I have to remember the brief here. This is for starting out a collection. I think the Grand Seiko is an excellent watch to buy if you already maybe have another mechanical watch. But for me, I think I'm gonna have to go with the Omega, the Omega Seamaster Diver 300 meters. If I'm trying to think of myself, I don't have any watches or none, you know, no, no nice luxury watches. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna be able to wear it a lot, regardless of where I am. Mm -hmm. I don't really know what I like, but I want to get into mechanical movements and kind of just what this whole high-end watchery is about. This is the one that text, check, checks all the boxes. Uh, it's got the Bond Association, so that kind of speaks to the nostalgia of my childhood. Mm -hmm. It's got a ton of features as far as, um, you know, it's got a rotating bezel, but one that has a ceramic insert, a ceramic dial, a helium escape valve. Um, but I think for me, the selling piece, in addition to the fact I could wear it, all day, every day, not have to worry about it getting magnetized or all of that, is the fact that I can see the movement. This is the only watch here that has a display case pack. And I'm trying to think back years and years ago when I was first getting into watches, one of the things that amazed me the most was just the little mechanical marvels that right. power them. Yeah. And I think being able to see that learn about it from just watching it and then and omegas is beautiful but yeah, right? yeah, like, yeah this I mean, is it's one finished of the, yeah. so gorgeous with yeah, the this is a great looking and, yeah, one yeah yeah that would be my pick that's a good that's a lot of watch for the money it's, it's a lot really of hard to go wrong on you know um pretty much a submariner equivalent i i will say i don't love the bracelet i i, I don't I, it doesn't really taper um, the design isn't quite my cup of tea but this watch looks so good on a number of straps i'd have no problem popping that off I feel, I feel the same way. I feel the same way, yeah. way about the Speedmaster. The bracelet isn't my favorite. It's probably my least favorite part of the whole watch. 
but uh, I give it a little bit of a pass on that because I do like to change straps all the time and you know uh, I would constantly mix it up and it looks good on almost everything. Kind of like the Speedmaster, you, this looks good on almost any strap. You could put it on rubber, you could put it on leather, you put it on NATO. It just looks good all the time. And last point worth mentioning, I said I couldn't wear a 41 millimeter Oyster Perpetual because it's too big. This watch actually measures 42, but because um, it's got a dive bezel on it, the actual size of the dial itself is smaller than the OP, and so it actually fits my wrist better despite oh, yeah. being one millimeter larger on paper. Plus, being the sport watch, it's almost uh, expected to be yeah. a little bit yeah. bigger. You kind of get it, it you know, there's a little bit of wiggle room there, and the dress watch, it's supposed to be a little more svelte and a little, a little cleaner looking. Well, both fantastic watches, but I think all five of these are fantastic watches that you could wear all day, every you day, go wrong and with any never other. actually yeah. need another watch. Um, well, you know our picks, but we want to know your picks. And also, the, these are only five watches, and there's many others that would be fantastic models for starting out a collection. So if you have any particularly good recommendations, be sure to post that in the comments too. Don't forget to tune in next week for another episode of Watch Talk. Until then, he's Justin, I'm Ripley, that's Chris, and that's Ziggy.